Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Last week, tonight's guest was at the center of an upheaval in state politics. Alessandra Biaggi defeated 24-year incumbent State Senator Jeff Klein to win the Democratic nomination for the 34th Senatorial District. Ms. Biaggi was one of six challengers to former members of the IDC who defeated incumbents, thereby signaling and ensuring there will be a different look to the Democratic slate on the November ballot. Tonight, we'll talk with Ms. Biaggi about her campaign, how she's been characterized by the media and by some in political circles, and also, if she is ultimately elected to the state Senate, how she plans to fill the shoes of a senator who, by all accounts, provided tremendous support to communities and community groups throughout the district. So please join me in welcoming the Democratic nominee for Senate in the Bronx and Westchester's 34th Senatorial District, Alessandra Biaggi. Thank you for having me on tonight. Nice to have you, and um, I, I, I'll apologize on your behalf that your voice, it's only because <laughs> it you've is. been campaigning and, <laughs> and the aftermath of campaigning. It is. I'm going to do my best tonight. All right. We appreciate <laughs> that. Um, let's just uh, start with the campaign. Sure. Um, why, do, why do you think you won? I mean, you, you were outspent uh, by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Millions. Maybe four, four to one. Mm -hmm. um, but you ended up uh, defeating uh, Jeff Klein. Uh, how did that happen? So I think that there's a few reasons why we won. I mean, the first one is that we started very early. Um, I've been knocking on doors since January uh, myself, and I've continued to knock on doors through Election Day. The second is that we had almost, I mean, an army is probably, it, it sounds like a violent uh, <laughs> adjective, but it really was an army of people who were just knocking on doors, talking to voters, spreading the message, explaining what, what the IDC was, and that there was another choice this September. Um, and then, honestly, at the end of the day, it was the hustle and the passion and all of this combined, right? It wasn't just the policy and understanding the issues. It was the combination of these, these three things, really, that I think allowed us to break through the noise and also the money. Because I think at the end of the day, I mean, we're still getting the numbers in. We were certainly outspent. I believe it was something like 10 to 1. Um, I think the, the final numbers on, on my opponent's end were 3 million, and I think we spent maybe a little bit over 300,000. And so when you compare those two things, I mean, certainly we shouldn't have won, but we had the ground game. We, we talked about it during uh, BronxNet's primary special, um, is that younger candidates may have a better feel for social mm -hmm. media. And you and all of those supporters leverage that social mm -hmm. media incredibly well. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that kind of volume from... Uh, not only uh, Senator Klein himself, but right. his supporters. You had that wonderful video that characterized Thank who you were, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I guess that maybe there is a new era coming in the way that uh, uh, elections, local elections can be handled. I think so. And I think, listen, for, for first-time candidates and for candidates who are going to be outspent, which is happening across the country, one of the best tools that you can use is social media. It's, it, it's inexpensive to boost your ads or to boost your content um, versus, you know, going on television. I mean, it's no um, probably surprise to anybody listening or watching that in New, York, in New York City, in the tri-state area, it's one of the most expensive media markets. And so an alternative to that is social media. And a lot of people are on social media. And we were able to not only target our voters, but to be able to get the vote out to specific areas of the district. Because as you know, this is a very gerrymandered district. It's very challenging to communicate with different areas of it. And so we made sure that all of our messages were specifically uh, reaching these areas. You, you couldn't be um, more diverse than looking at Hunts Point, the East Bronx, it's and wild. Riverdale. 
<laughs> yes. I, th I think it was. Um, uh, and Rikers Island. I mean, there's three. I think true. there's three registered voters there, but it just shows you, right, the breadth. I of think I think it was the former senator who had this seat, Guy Valella, who said mm -hmm. it was like a lobster. Is what it was. It shaped looks like, like a lobster. lobster it, it does. Shaped. It does. Um, have you talked to Senator uh, talked to Senator Klein since? We've not yet connected on the phone, which I'm actually a little bit disappointed about. I'm looking forward to connecting with him on the phone, but he did leave me a message to congratulate me um, on Thursday evening, which I thought was very gracious. And I called him back, um, thanking him and also telling him that not only did I appreciate, but I understood and acknowledged all of the work that he's done for District 34. Uh, and and I, I do want to mention um, that not only for me, but uh, for Ms. Biagi as well, we are all aware, uh, aware that she has not won an election. Mm -hmm. You referred to it as an election. It actually was a primary. Primary election. There will be an election. Senator Klein, um, do we expect he will still stay on the independent uh, we'll uh, line? And uh, there is a Republican and a conservative mm -hmm. candidate as That's well. Right. So um, I, we certainly take nothing for take granted. Take nothing for granted. We're, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, conduct the uh, rest of the questioning in, in that vein. Um, do you expect your supporters will still be out there with the T-shirts and the banners and the social <laughs> media and everything else? We do, we do, and I think that's just testament to what we've built um, over these many months. I mean, we've already gone back to them and expressed incredible amounts of gratitude. I mean, if you were in the district on election day, and, and I have word that it's, it was really not just our district, but all of the anti-IDC districts, the energy was electric. And it brought really a, a different life to the district that excited our volunteers. And uh, so they're uh, ready to go through November. About the IDC or about something else? Or Both. I, th I, think it's, I think it's many things. I think it's, it was the anti-IDC sentiment. I think it was also the idea that new leadership was necessary and needed that people really wanted to see, as I heard many times, fresh blood for whatever that's whatever that whatever that's worth, and they showed up for that. You received a tweet, um, uh, I don't know, yesterday or the day before, from Marcos Crespo yes. in the Bronx um, organization. It sounds like they are ready to say, well, she is going to be our candidate. There yes. We have the, the tweet on the screen. Um, and then uh, you responded, thank you, thank yes. him for his grace, um, uh, his graceful um, uh, comments. Um, do you expect to communicate with them? Do you, and, and certainly in the case of um, Assemblyman Crespo, mm -hmm. I mean, he's in the state. Yes. Um, how, how do you, how would you like that to work if at least at this point and then of course if you are elected? Yes, yeah, so I mean the first step right is making communication. I've been um, very really excited to see um, not only Assemblymember Crespo but also Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr., um, State Senator Luis Sepulveda and many others who I think have I come. I saw a tweet from Assemblyman Dinowitz That's as right, well. exactly, That's Assembly, right. Assemblymember Dinowitz. Many um, of the Bronx politicians who have previously backed my opponent are showing their full support and I think that that's just a testament to what they care about the most which is our community and so now that the Democratic primary is done um, it's really wonderful not only to have them coming out to support but also it, it's an opening for a dialogue and so I intend not only to meet with them but to build a relationship with them because at the end of the day the reason why I got into this race was to serve this community and to really show up to make sure that every single person is heard and that we have all hands on deck and people brought to the table so I'm looking forward to that this opens up a whole line of questioning that I want to pursue sure. because the same thing did not happen with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez mm -hmm. and, and I, I pulled out some of the things that and this is what I was referring to it at the opening um, quote, quotes from uh, Facebook people they call the Bronx Bolshevik mm -hmm. uh, there is this idea that she has um, said that she um, is a democratic socialist mm -hmm. when you were asked that directly mm -hmm on our debate, you said, I'm not a socialist, right. I am a Democrat, yet there was, you know, photographs of you with uh, uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, yes. she supported your campaign, yes. so maybe you could lay out for us what is the same, what is similar, and if there is, what is different so that sure. people could be clear about where Absolutely. this is all at. You've been called a socialist. Yes, I have. I have been called a socialist, and I want to just set the record straight right now. I am not a socialist, although what I will say is we are in a... Uh, and a moment where we should be accepting of all political political ideologies and so we should make space for those things and I think that her election proves that there is space for democratic socialism. I am a progressive, I am a democrat um, and so I think that's the first place where we probably well, what, diverge. What is the, uh, I mean, it's all ideology and, and sure. frankly I, as people who know I've done this show for all these years I'm really interested in practical solutions yes. 
I don't try not to get lost in ideology. What is the distinction, the ideological distinction for you mm -hmm. when you say that? When, when I say I'm a progressive. Well, versus a socialist. Versus a socialist. Because so, some people lump it all together. If you look at the, so I have not fully studied the entire DSA platform. It is very long, it is very large. Um, but there are definitely points on there where we diverge and there are points where we converge. And so one example for, is Medicare for All. I am a strong believer in Medicare for All. I am a full supporter of the New York Health Act in New York State. I believe that health care is a basic human right, that every single person in New York State should have health care. And I think that's one of the way, and one of the areas where we definitely come together. I mean, I'd have to probably go point by point reading through it, but what I what I will say is this. Having glanced through it um, a few times, there were some things on there, and I, to memory right now, it, it, I have not committed it to memory, that definitely did not sit with my values, and so that's why the, I don't align myself with the, the DSA platform. The, the technical definitions would say that um, socialists want a government by, in essence, community. And, and so I'm going to posit that, that maybe, and that opposes, of course, what the free market and capitalism mm -hmm. is about. Can I make a guess that that's sure. fair? Sure. I mean, yes. Is I'll, that fair? It is. It's fair, but also I think what's important is that the re one of the reasons I ran in this race was because the things that I believe, my inherent values, the things that I'm fighting for, is a party and a government that is for the people, by the people. It's of the people. And, and one of the things I said even on election night was that the political currency is people. It's not dollars. And so one of the things that I care very much about as a progressive is taking out of our government and our politics special interest money because we've seen it time and time again not only corrupt the system but really make, become a, ver a very big problem when it comes to legislating. And so I think that's another area actually where we agree on. Um, but I definitely am a Democrat, progressive, proud of it, and I look forward to um, supporting all of the Democratic pieces of legislation in the state Senate if and when elected in November. Uh, the, the next question that's related to this, we're, we're going one step at a time, and that is, how do you pay for all this stuff? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the criticism is out there. There is certainly there is a large conservative movement in, mm -hmm. in parts of the Bronx as well as throughout the state and, of mm -hmm. course, throughout the country that says these things can't work because it's only going to up our tax dollars and of course that gets lost in bureaucracy and we never really get. How do you pay for uh, single payer health care, mm -hmm. Medicare for all, free college tuition or all the other things that you might value and think are worthwhile? So this is a great question and also I want to just start by saying that not everything that I'm advocating for actually costs anything. For example, the Reproductive Health Act, which would codify Roe v. Wade, does not cost New York anything. The Comprehensive Contraceptive Coverage Act, a, a bill that would allow to have women um, have access to different kinds of contraception that's not federally covered, another thing that would actually maybe even cost us a little bit, early voter registration in New York State um, and making sure that we actually have early voting. $6.4 million compared to the billions of dollars that we spend on infrastructure in the state seems like a very small investment now that we should be making to make sure that every single person is invested. Going back to single payer in the New York Health Act, there have been many studies done. The Rand Corporation, which is a very conservative think tank, did a study actually before the election, the September election, and it said it actually would be fiscally responsible to invest in a single payer system in New York. Not only would it save 98% of New Yorkers on health care costs, it would create jobs, it would reduce copays and deductibles and premiums, it would allow for every single person, again, in New York State to have health benefits. And so when you think about healthcare as, the, as the, let's say the example that we're talking about how can we not invest in this as we currently stand people are going bankrupt on their health care costs and so we should make it a priority of the states to not only invest in it but to think about progressive ways to pay for it and so if that's a small tax on people even if it was five dollars every paycheck right it it would it would be by somebody's paycheck so that it's fair and then that conceivably based on what you just said could balance out because maybe their their bills uh, their health bills and, and you know that you That's right. we all end up paying you say wait a minute what what did i just pay for absolutely you know, i mean a lot of our, a lot of us have health insurance and when we come down to it when we get our bills in the mail we realize that our health insurance that we paid for and that we pay a lot of money for doesn't even cover some of the basic things that we need and so on a single payer system this is a system that would actually cover those things and would cost us less uh, since we're talking about money, and, and you mentioned that you had congratulated Senator Klein on mm -hmm. his service to yes. uh, the district for um, all these years, among the things that he has done, he's the, they call it a breadwinner. He's brought home the bacon. Mm -hmm. You can think of it any way you want. Um, 
very poignantly the morning after the primary, mm -hmm. uh, you, I assume you're aware that the Johnson Avenue Festival was mm -hmm. canceled. KRVC um, then put out a, a, um, a, an email that said, we get a quarter of a million dollars mm -hmm. of funding for KRVC. Without going into why the, the uh, festival was canceled or whether it was right, should they be concerned that that money that funds a pretty viable and mm -hmm. vital uh, organization could be in jeopardy simply because you're not there to move it and get it and mm -hmm. uh, advocate for it, et cetera. So I'm going to first start by saying that I am going to fight like hell to make sure that District 34 has everything that it possibly needs. Not only will I do that, I'm going to work with the leaders in the state Senate to make sure that the funds are allocated and that they're allocated, allocated equitably. It's very disappointing that the KRVC event was canceled, but I will also note that um, my opponent is still currently the state senator, that you know, if this is something that the community really cares about, that we should be working together to figure out ways that we can, maybe if it doesn't happen this time, maybe it can happen in the next few weeks, because these are things that matter to the community. And so what I'm saying right now is that I'm committed not only to making sure that the events and the really the benefits that the community have enjoyed over these years not only not go away, but that we figure out together solutions to make sure that they happen. Is it natural to think that there will be some lag in time? I mean, you're not going to go in there January 1st. You're going to have your hand out. But there's, you know, I guess also part of that would depend mm -hmm. on whether there's a Democratic majority. That, that's that my would, second point, actually. That, and I would that like would to probably touch make on it that. a lot easier for you. Absolutely. If, assuming that you win. I'm, again, pre trying to presume nothing. Yes. And so that's another thing that's actually very important here because Focusing from now until November on the on the districts in this state that we can flip from red to blue will actually mean if we flip one seat, we can have the Democratic majority in New York State. And what that means is a whole host of things for all of the districts that are being led by Democratic state senators, by Democratic assembly members. Um, and then that goes down all the way even to the city council. We'll, we will be able to work together as a community to make sure that these Democratic districts actually have what they need. Uh I, I pulled out some, you know, I, I'm a voracious listener to the, have my ear to the ground yes. for what people in the Bronx Smart. are saying. So I pulled out a couple of things off of Facebook, a couple of quotes from people mm -hmm. who are commenting on your victory. Mm -hmm. One that I pulled out said, I guess Biagi only plans on helping her Democratic co constituents. Sad. He was a senator who never asked what your party affiliation was. He helped everyone. She won't, and that's why Republicans will vote for him. We don't want a socialist. So that, that that's is a disappointing quote that to I hear. Pulled. So well, again, but you've got to hear it. It's out there. Thank you. No, and I and I listen. There, I make space for all types of comments, and whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I will always always hold space for that. So again. I am not a socialist, I am a Democrat. I am excited to represent every single person in District 34. It does not matter what your political ideology is. One of the things that matters very much to me is constituent services, which means that nobody will ever be turned away. Every single person will have a seat at the table. I will listen to everybody, no matter what party you're from. That does not matter to me at all. And so when people have unmet needs, it is my job or will be my job to make sure that those needs are met, no matter what party. You're in. Okay, fair enough. You worked for Governor Cuomo. Did yes. he reach out? Um, I don't believe so, unless I've missed a message. I have to say that I'm right now currently working said, through. Mr. Governor, I'm busy. All of no, I would never do that actually, <laughs> and I will actually congratulate him on his victory as well. But I haven't, I haven't gone through um, every single message. I have hundreds of messages in my phone. All, it's a good problem to have. I feel very, <laughs> very great. Keep calling. Grat I guess. A lot of gratitude, but not yet. He, he. Um, didn't sound particularly complimentary mm -hmm. to the um, uh, to the victories of uh, uh, all the um, uh, uh, insurgents who mm -hmm. uh, defeated uh, IDC members. His quote was, "Last night was meaningless. We arranged the deck chairs." Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about that? And, and uh, presumably, you know the governor, and, and um, I'm, I'm assuming if you are elected, you'd mm -hmm. you'd want to work with him closely. I think that it's meaningful. I mean, every election that's won by Democrats is meaningful, and so I am excited to work with him. I'm excited to work with all, um, if elected, all of the anti-IDC candidates who have won their primaries in September, and hopefully will win in November as well. And I think it's a it's a 
really wonderful moment in New York State politics to prove, again, that the power, the political currency of our time is people, that we are attempting to change a culture in Albany that a lot of people have been very cynical about. And you have this whole cohort of people who are bringing this positive energy, this fresh approach, um, this excitement, really, to a legislature that a lot of people have been turned off by. Um, and I think it's going to make a really big difference. Do you know him well enough to say uh, at some point, uh, Governor, you know, if again, if you are elected, uh, you know, could let's just have a conversation and get a read I, off? I don't know him well enough to do that. But I, again, I, I love Maybe talking to people. <laughs> and I am, I am, there's always a door open for every single person to speak to. Uh, you worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign. Yes, I did which didn't turn out that well. <laughs> uh, things you learned, things that you even applied in your own campaign and said, yes. uh, well, maybe we ought to not do that or we ought to handle things in a different way? You know, that campaign, having not done that campaign, I would not have been prepared for this one. Really? Yes, I, there's no doubt because that was my first campaign, if you can imagine. So I, my first campaign, presidential race, I started on the vetting team. I then did national operations and that was like building the plane while I was flying it. I mean, you have 50 states that are asking you for things at all times. You're trying to manage their budget, their needs, figuring out uh, staffing issues, opening offices. It was like mass chaos at all moments. And that was very much what this, what this campaign was like too because mm -hmm. you have a lot of things that are incoming and you have to figure out how to triage them. That campaign taught me how to triage them. It also taught me how to manage very large budgets. I mean, I managed a $500 million budget, 38 state directors, again, all had competing needs. And making sure that their needs were met were my top priority and we always met their needs and made sure that they had everything that they actually needed at the end of the day. Um, in terms of things that we would have done differently, I mean, that's hard to say because I feel, for, the for the Clinton campaign versus you know, this, I, I, I mean, we did everything we could. I'm not going back there at this point. No, and, and you know, I, we did everything that we could um, with what we had. Um, we definitely had l different resources than we did during the Obama campaign, um, but we did everything that we could. And so that campaign taught me you got to make make the use of what you've got. And our campaign from the very beginning, I mean, we started at a dining room table, two people, and then we grew it from the basement of my parents' home. And then we're able to finally grow offices in Riverdale and also in Westchester Square. Um, and it just showed the power of grassroots, the power of being able to bring everybody to the table and to give everybody a voice. And that's how we got this campaign to where we are on limited resources. Um, what, what do you have to learn uh, once you get on the job? I'm, go I'm going to posit mm -hmm. one thing, um, is that your familiarity with the northern parts of the borough are probably stronger mm -hmm. than the southern parts of the district. There's a lot of people, and there's a lot of very big issues yes. down there. Like, you want to start there and say you're going to learn a little more about the, about Hunts Point and the South Bronx? I think that, th I, listen, there's always a lot to learn. I, I could have been doing this for 20 years and there would still be things to learn. And that's, and <laughs> I've been that's, doing it for 24 and, years and, you, and I'm still, getting there. Exactly. <laughs> you, there's, I, I think that once you feel like you've stopped learning, then your mind has closed. And so I have a very open mind. I'm excited to, again, represent every single area of this district. I've spent a lot of assuming time. Assuming that you win. Assuming that I win. That's exactly right. Um, I have spent a lot of time in the East. I've spent a lot of time in the Southeast. And and I'm excited right now to spend these next few weeks and months not only going, of course, back into the northern parts of this of this district, but really making sure that everybody knows who did not vote for me that there is a seat at the table again and that I want to hear what their issues are, hear what their needs are, and will be excited to work with them and to represent them in Albany and that they actually do have a partner in me if elected in November. Aside from... Uh I don't want to call them ideological issues, issues like um, mm -hmm. you talked about uh, Roe v. Wade and yes. you talk about um, uh, single-payer health care. What, what are the hardcore community issues, yes. things in neighborhoods that you think, that you see, yes. that you could uh, help affect if, in fact, you are elected? Our rent the, laws can be rent much laws. stronger. Yes, our rent laws. I mean, this is something I campaigned on. I will continue to campaign on through November, and this is something that will be one of my biggest priorities. I cannot tell you the number of doors that I have knocked on where people have said to me, my rent goes up 20% a year, or my landlord has harassed me, or you know somebody came in and they did an improvement and then all of a sudden that improvement invoice was right on my rent. So closing the loopholes in our rent laws so that we can return preferential rent um, and vacancy decontrol and eviction bonuses, also repealing the Earth Set Law, which is a bill and a law that gives Albany really the control of our downstate New York City rent stabilization law. I mean, these are things that the state Senate is poised to be able to fix that have got to be made a priority. And with a Democratic majority, we actually can do this, which is why some of my focus will be helping those 
districts, we can flip from red to blue because I know that with a Democratic majority, we can actually do those things. Also, public school funding. I mean, this is something I have talked about every single day. Our, our districts are owed $88 million in public school funding in District 34. Um, and it's no surprise that if you go to certain areas of this district, these schools really need the funding. And it's a priority that we have got to take seriously. Uh, you know, you, as you listed some of those things, uh, I came back in my mind to what you had said. A, a really big key for you to more easily be able to address mm -hmm. those things would be if there is yes. a Democratic um, uh, a majority. Yes. I mean, without that, uh, you might be uh, <laughs> running in place as so many. Uh, I'll give you another um, a quote. Sure. Uh, the state Senate is supposed to be a check on the state assembly and veto their more costly and crazy ideas. We won't have that anymore. We will have two legislative bodies trying to outdo each other in spending our tax mm. dollars. I guess that relates to what we were talking about earlier. What mm -hmm. do you think? I think I hear that, and I hear that as a fear, and I acknowledge it. And what I will say is this. Um, if elected in November, there is no... There is, there is no dollar that will be spent without incredible thoughtfulness, um, bringing everybody again to the table. And, and I will say this because I really believe this, having Andrea Stewart-Cousins, Senator Stewart-Cousins as our leader means that we will actually be represented by a responsible leader who will ensure that that will never happen. And so it's exciting to be able to have two bodies in the legislature that will be a Democratic majority in the state Senate if we actually flip those seats. Um, but I, just knowing what I know about the leaders of these two conferences, these are two people, um, and I'm, the second leader I'm referring to is um, Leader Heasty. These are two people who want the best for their districts and for the state of New York, and being led by them will mean that the dollars are actually spent responsibly. Uh, Alessandra Biaggi, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. Win, lose, or draw. We hope you'll continue to use uh, BronxNet Television thank in this you. program to um, to say what you want to say. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you okay, for having me on. Thank you so much, um, folks. If you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, send us an email at Bronx Talk at BronxNet. Dot org. You can send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook mm -hmm. page and we read them on the air during a future edition of our program. And if your question or concern needs to be forwarded, we do that as well. We've done it on a regular basis. Also, of course, check out our archives at BronxNet.org. you find Bronx Talk by following the watch menu on the new BronxNet website. We thank our producer is Helen Greenberg, our director this evening, Lisi Dominguez. And uh, guess what? We will be back next week. She might not be here. But somebody will be. Good night. See you.